Hello, my name is Peter Robak and uh, welcome again to Elmer FEM webinar series. This is the second one in the webinar series. And um, uh, today we'll talk about uh, Elmer features in more deeply. And before we go into details, I would like to uh, present the other people today. So please, Mikael and Jonathan. Yes, hello. Mikael Kanra, also from CSC and taking care of some of the practicalities now when it comes to the Elmer webinar series. Hi, my name is Jonathan Velasco. I work as a, an application specialist at CSC and I'm specialized in electromagnetics. I will be helping with the Q&A. Good, and um, continuing from there in terms of practicalities, here are a couple of, uh, of, of guidelines in terms of the flow of the, uh, of the, of the webinar today. So uh, reading out loud pretty much, uh, you uh, have a Q&A window and uh, we ask you to write your questions that address the substance of the seminar in the Q&A window. And these uh, Q&A questions will then be addressed after the presentations. Uh, the chat is also available, as you can see, but uh, we would urge you to use that for, yes, general discussion. And that's also where we get some in instructions uh, in, the, in the chat window in terms of use of Zoom. If you have issues in terms of the functionality of Zoom, you can also write them in the, in the chat window. Uh, and uh, as you see, the presentation slides also are made available to you at the uh, uh, URL address you see on the screen. Uh, we can also post that actually in the, in the chat window. And uh, as you see also, the webinar will be recorded and uh, this will be then viewable on uh, uh, Elmer's YouTube channel in about a week uh, after the uh, seminar is over. So, I hand the word now to our presenters today. Thank you. So just a, a brief view on the coming program. So we are here on the second presentation. So overview of the capabilities of Elmer. The next week we will go to parallel computing with Elmer and then starts the more interesting stuff, at least for me. So the external presentations. So we'll hear about, uh, for instance, Elmer OpenFOAM library from its developer, Yuri Svensels. Also, Eli Stackel and Frederick Trilord will talk about very interesting application. Uh, you will probably hear more about it later and how to apply electrical circuits into it. Uh, Mika Malinen will also talk about more deeply on solid mechanical solvers in Elmer. Binhai Zaher will talk about uh, open source use of uh, in uh, modeling electrical machines. And uh, Arvid Enders Zeitwitz will talk about Pi Elmer, which is the Python interface to Elmer. And Roman Zvretsik will talk about uh, uh, microwave modeling with Elmer in industrial applications. And there are additional slots available. So if you are interested, uh, contact us and we maybe can find you a slot in, in May. So today I'll talk about the physical models of Elmer and actually more about their common features. So what are the commonalities between the dif different physical solvers? So I focus more on the solvers that are sort of partial differential equations. There are a lot of other solvers too, but that's the focus. So uh, we make a, a look, have a look on the models manual to sort of see what the solvers actually are. I then present you a case of 12 solvers and then take some features from the library that actually are used by many or all of the models. So I took this approach because you are a little bit uh, sort of mixed crowd, about 50% of you uh, based on the Gallup last time are just newcomers into Elmer, 40% have used Elmer and 10% are actually developers. So, so it's rather difficult to please everybody. So this is a little bit goes more deeply than the last presentation. Uh, 
so it should offer something to the developers even, but maybe less if you are just coming into Elmer world, then it, you may at times find this a little bit steep. But, uh, well, I hope you still find something useful in the presentation. So first, I start from a minimal solver input file example. So if you have done even one case with Elmer, you ended up creating a solver input file that looks like this. So it's uh, something that humans can read and the computer can also read it and you can edit it and uh, you can study it. And one specific feature here, which I want to draw your attention to is the use of a solver. It's, we have a concept of solvers. It's basically, uh, basically a physical module. And here, for instance, it's a heat solver, uh, which has its specific keywords. So like here, heat conductivity, temperature, and heat flux. And we call these solvers or sometimes modules. And there are many of those. So the success of Elmer as a multiphysics code, it builds quite a lot on the abstraction of these solvers. So because of the high level of abstraction, we can be quite flexible in implementation and also in simulation. So a solver, it's an abstract sort of dynamically loaded object with a standard API. So uh, we can develop those and compile those without touching the main library. And actually, there is no upper limit to the number of solvers. So you can have one, two, five, seven, ten, twelve, or how many you want of them. It depends on the complexity of your problem. Uh, and solvers may be active in different domains and even in different meshes. And then automatic mapping of field variables are performed when requested. Uh, Peter, can I make a small intervention? Okay, there we yeah. go. Thank you. Uh, your video was missing. Now we can see you again. So please continue. Okay. And uh, the solvers, they perform a limited, well-defined task. So, so uh, most often these tasks are partial differential equations or their solution, but there are also many other uses for these well-defined tasks. So you could think of a solver as sort of a atomic operator that has, does some uh, specific task. And uh, these solvers all utilize a large selection of services from the library. And the library itself, it doesn't almost at all have any knowledge of physics. So it's, you could imagine that the library is, uh, is the mathematician and then the solvers are the physicists. So, so the sort of division is rather sharp. So we have a lot of models. I thought about how to best present them, and uh, I think I'll present them uh, directly from the uh, from the uh, Elmer models manual. I hope you can see this. So uh, this is the content of the Elmer models manual. I I edit it a little bit. Uh, uh, models manual so that it would look better on, on the screens, but you find this updated version also on the, on the update sites. So the solvers have been grouped by the area of, of use. So first we have models for fluid mechanics and transport phenomena. Then if we have models for solid mechanics, we have specific models for acoustics. We have models for el electromagnetics, quite a few of them. And, uh, other physical models, uh, we have free surfaces, phase chains, and particle dynamics. And we have mesh adaptation. Uh, so if the mesh is changing, moving, how to do that? And uh, then we have some solvers that do derived fields. Uh, so given an existing field, you can compute derived fields like fluxes or divergences, divergences etc. And uh, then we have saving of data and results and reading of data in different formats. And then in the end, we have experimental or obsolete solvers. So these are ones that maybe once were 
uh, used for some reason, but but maybe no longer represent what we think is is the best practice. So uh, all in all, you see there are quite many many solvers, and uh, when you are in a particular field, you of course want to sort of uh, start looking at whether your uh, model is able to solve your problems. So for instance, a heat equation seems to be the most popular solver. So you can go here and see the equations. So, so uh, if you have a re reasonable sort of knowledge on the physics, you can easily estimate whether this is something that will be useful for you. So I would say that these uh, this is maybe the most used solver in Elmer. It has some very nice features. For instance, it has phase change model and it has radiation, which uh, are lacking in some other, other software. Uh, and uh, it's rather generic. It has, for instance, temperature control. So you can control the temperature at one point and, and request that the output or the heat source is scaled so that you can uh, get the desired temperature at the temperature control point. Then we have, for instance, Navier-Stokes equation. This is the legacy Navier-Stokes equation that has been extensively used, for instance, in the area of computational classology. So this is a monolithic version of, of Navier-Stokes. So we solve the velocity and pressure components at once. And uh, there is now a newer version of this solver uh, for the computational classology community. It can be, be also used by others for incompressible flows only. And uh, also here you have some exotic features like, like boundary conditions uh, for slip, slip boundary conditions and uh, etc. So you can solve problems in arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian coordinates. That means that this can be applied to fluid structure interaction. And you have a large selection of non unitarian material models, for instance. Uh, then I would think that linear elasticity is something that has been uh, there quite a long time. And it uh, also has some nice features, I think, Nowadays, finite elasticity may be more of the sort of focus of development. So it uh, can deal with nonlinear material laws in some degree and also geometric nonlinearities. So this is maybe the most important uh, solver uh, for structural mechanics. Also, there has been recent developments in shell. Uh, theory or shell equations. So this solver is also uh, at least theoretically sort of loaded. So you can, uh, you need some mathematics background when you study this solver. In acoustics, we have some special solvers also, for instance, the linear Navier-Stokes equation for the frequency domain, uh, electromagnetics, uh, Currently here, maybe the most important solver is the uh, computational magnetic fields in 3D. So this came about uh, when we started to apply uh, edge finite elements. I think it was almost 10 years ago. And gradually it uh, got more and more features and, uh, and uh, it has been, for instance, applied to the modeling of electrical machines. and. Uh, I think that the uh, use of edge curl conforming elements, so these edge elements is the one important factor because there are not so many software around, especially in the in the open source that, that would allow the solution of these equations. So I won't go into details of these equations, but, but you can study the sort of documentation. And uh, well, there are, lots of other solvers. So for instance, if you save material, you, uh, you for instance, 
probably use this without output solve in way or any other. So this is the one that saves the data in BTU output format. Uh, sometimes it does so behind the hood, but basically this is the solver that that deals with the BTU output. And it has a number of uh, also keywords that you can control to, for instance, save just what you need or, or uh, sort of, for instance, affect uh, uh, accuracy, use binary or, or ASCII, etc. So uh, one of the first things that when you start using a new solver, I would recommend uh, reading this corresponding chapter in the models manual. I tried to actually a little bit make a sort of coarse grained uh, description of these models that would make justice to them. But after trying maybe an hour, I, I understood that this is sort of a futile sort of uh, trial. So, so it, it is quite difficult to make justice to all these solvers in a sort of a short period of time. So I chose this sort of approach that I mainly give some pointers. And, uh, and uh, I think here are some of the historical solvers that have been important. Uh, heat solve, flow solve, stress solve, Whitney AV solver. And I think there are some solvers that some have maybe some hidden potential, like the shell solver that has been recently updated vector Helmholtz that um, we actually will he hear about in the in the presentation for the microwave modeling. And also there is a new model mix Poisson that uh, uses HD bases, so-called phase elements. And actually the, this sort of particle advector solver that uses particles to advect fields without any diffusion. So sort of semi-Lagrangian particle tracker. It uh, sort of is sometimes a nice combination because uh, finite elements is not always the best method, but sometimes you can have some desired effects when you use particle-based methods. And uh, Elmer is not maybe the workhorse for particle-based methods, but but you can sort of have them as an ingredient if, if you don't need gazillions of them. And there are also quite a many undocumented models. So if you are wondering why is this solver, for instance, not there in the documentation, it's just because it's sometimes you have had time to write the solver, uh, but maybe not the documentation, or or maybe sometimes the documentation is lagging because we weren't quite happy with the sort of outcome of the solver, and it sort of stays in a, in some phase where it is not sort of in the in production. So, for instance, all the turbulence models are in this category. So you can find that there are a lot of turbulence models like Spalar, Spalar Almar, SSTK Omega. You have V2F, uh, and you have K omega, K epsilon, etc. All these basically are are there, and they are correct by their sort of uh, verification, but they are not terribly robust. So, so uh, they have not become like uh, widely used modules. And for instance, there are solvers like distance solver, etc., that could be maybe documented and used more, and model PDE, and um, a lot of lot of different solvers that uh, could maybe find usage, but but they are unfortunately not documented currently. So I have a question uh, that we will ask you. Say maybe Jonathan, you can you can tell the question and ask it, ask it. Yeah, at this point, we're going to show you guys a poll. Uh, we would like to know the number of solvers in your most complicated Elmer simulation setup so far. So if it's 0, 1, 2 to 3, between 4 and 6, 7 or 10, or more than 10, uh, I will launch the poll now, and you will be able to see it on your screen. Let's give it a couple seconds. Okay, a couple more people are voting.
Okay. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And these are the results. So the majority of the people use between two and three solvers, as we see on the screen. And then probably between four and six, which I, I think is a good number. Yes, there were uh, a few persons who had more than 10. Maybe you could raise your hand if you want to comment what is your application. So, uh, do we have some hands raised? Okay, I guess nobody raised their hand, but but um, yes, so you see there is a large sort of difference in the complexity of cases. So when you started using Elmer, probably with the Elmer GUI, you maybe thought that, okay, typically people use one or two solvers, but actually that's not really the case. So uh, there are many, many people who use quite a few solvers. So, so uh, I think that going around up to 10 when you do some very complex workflows is quite normal. So to sort of emphasize that you can use really a lot of these solvers, I created, this is actually an old case. I added now it also to the test case so, so it can be run in a few seconds. So this example has 12 solvers. So it is a very small case to be able to run sort of in, in a, under a minute. And the purpose is mainly to show that you can have a large number of different solvers and uh, you should not sort of be afraid to add atomistic solvers to perform specific tasks. And uh, this is a simple case. We have a square and we have a cold wall or a hot wall. And you can guess that we initiate a natural convection role here when buoyancy is modeled with the Businesk approximation. So let's see. Uh, this, these are the 12 solvers. So we have a heat solver and flow solver, and these are weakly coupled. And the system is iterated until convergence. And then we have 10 other solvers. So there is a flux solver that computes the, the heat flux, the diffusive heat, heat flux. We have a stream solver that uh, computes the stream function. We have a vorticity solver that computes the vorticity field of a uh, vector field. We have a divergence solver that checks for the divergence free con condition of the incompressible flow. So you can see that it's actually like not completely divergence free because of the numerical errors. We have a shear rate solver that computes the shear rate from the from the solution. We have an isosurface solver that actually generates an isosurface at a given value and then, then can save this isosurface uh, to some file for further use. We have a result output solver that writes the data in different formats. We have save, save grid data that can save data on a uniform grid. We have a save line that can save data on given lines. So even though you would have the full data, it's maybe sometimes nice to save the lines. Just for instance, in a very heavy computation, you would not like to perform the post-processing like in power view maybe, but why not just save the lines and get the data that you need economically. And then we have save scholars that saves various reductions of the, of the model. So here are some primary fields that are being computed. So we have a pressure, temperature, and velocity that are primary fields. And here is the velocity field also as a, as a vector field. Uh, then we can compute some derived fields. So here is the shear rate fields, the stream function, the vorticity field, and the divergence free field. So you see there is uh, some errors in the divergence near the corners. And uh, you can compute heat flux. So this is the conductive heat flux and uh, you can compute so-called nodal loads. So these are the nodal heat loads. So you see that the heat is escaping here and coming in here. And then we can 
export the data uh, to different post processors. So here we see the data as it's exported to GID, to GMesh and Paraview. And we can save the, for instance, the total flux during uh, iteration. So here I've saved uh, uh, the total flux as the iteration uh, converges. So we needed about five, six iterations for a nice convergent and then the sort of different models for computing the flux, they, they converge. And uh, here is an example of save line. So we can save the flux on a boundary and here different sort of methods of computing the flux are, are compared. One with sort of nodal, nodal uh, loads and one with sort of a continuous approximation of the fluxes. Yeah, so you see that you can have a very large number of different solvers. And, uh, and here I go then through some of their common features that almost every one of these partial differential equation solvers have in common. They also have something other in common, but this is sort of a limited in, in scope. So one thing you need to understand when you understand, if you want to understand the Elmer simulation is, is the nature of, of the nested iterations in Elmer. So basically we have different solvers, like here are two solvers that then are sold as a loosely coupled system. So we have so-called steady state iteration level where these two solvers are iterated until they are converged. If it's a time-dependent simulation, then this is even un inside the time integration uh, loop. So this is the sort of loop that ensures that the uh, physical solution is consistent with all the solvers. So the steady state iteration or coupled system iteration loop. And then we have for each solver, we have nonlinear iteration loops maybe if needed. Sometimes these can be sort of performed uh, at the same time, so not uh, uh, losing the sort of resources for the nonlinear iteration when we anyway are going to iterate the uh, steady state level. And then we have the most inner iteration is the linear iteration for the for the linear system. In the case we have a have an iterative linear solver. And you see that we have here a number of then keywords that control these iterations. So for the outermost, we have steady state. For the uh, sort of nonlinear level, we have nonlinear keywords. And for the innermost, we have linear system keywords. So these are then used to ensure that your solution is, is sort of consistent. And sometimes, of course, they don't converge and you will end up having a sort of ill-behaving solution and uh, maybe some core dump even. And uh, you should follow the sort of the, how your uh, iterations converge. So if they don't converge, you probably won't get any reasonable results. So the innermost loop is the linear system level, uh, which is basically about just solving a linear system that is coming from the discretization of the finite element system. And uh, I will go through this next week when we have uh, the lecture about parallel computing with Elmer. So these are heavily coupled to the parallel strategies often. Uh, but the nonlinear system is something that is more related to the physics. So you can have a nonlinear equation, like for instance, a heat equation that is linear becomes nonlinear when you introduce uh, temperature dependent heat conductivity. So then you may need so some recipes to sort of deal with that. The one recipes that you iterate many times, you have nonlinear system max iterations more than one. And uh, sometimes it doesn't e easily converge. So you may as a first remedy, add some relaxation. So you don't take the full suggested new solution, but you take part of the old one too. So this is the nonlinear system relaxation factor. And then of course you have to have some measure how you measure the success of your convergence. And we have different 
measures that we can do. So we have we can check how the norm develops, norm of the solution, how the uh, sort of solution uh, uh, compared to the previous solution uh, behaves. So this is called uh, solution norm. And then we have a residual norm, which is a uh, backward looking. So we, we uh, built the new uh, matrix corresponding to the uh, new solution and check that whether the sort of backward looking uh, residual is is smaller than than we would like to have it, and when this sort of measure for the convergence is smaller than the normal system convergence tolerance, then we are happy and and can stop the nonlinear iteration. And the exact same sort of measures and uh, iterations etc. apply for the steady state level. So this is a sort of quite straightforward when you when you understand it but of course it may be difficult to sort of grasp what is happening so to sort of summarize it we often so follow this iterative strategy uh, if you have a just like uh, one directional dependence between different physical equations you can use this kind of hierarchical simulation so you don't you need know that by by construction, your system is such that you just have one directional coupling, then you can do like this. And then when you have really difficult problems, then you need to do something like this. So you, you basically end up having some kind of a strongly coupled system where you, where you solve some monolithic problems or, or uh, will have some more advanced numerical methods. But this, is, this iteration method is basically something that often works. and and uh, we are sort of 90% of the time in multi -fix problems, we are using that one. So uh, luckily, the nature often wor works in, in ways that allow us to use this kind of method. Uh, one way that these equations can be coupled in Elmer is, is that they are directly coupled by a keyword which is sort of applied in any of these solvers. So uh, when we have coupling between different solvers, it would be almost impossible to enumerate the different possibilities to have this kind of coupling. So what we do instead is, is uh, basically allow that any parameter appearing on the solver is sort of of very free form. So we should be able to sort of give the parameters uh, without limiting them to sort of constants or whatever. So the recipe that we have created uh, is that real valued keywords, when we fetch them from the solver input file, they can be of very sort of many different types. So we, you can, for instance, of course, they can be constant. So density could be constant, like 1,000. But density could also be a function. Like if we have a function of like this, which is basically a sort of Boussinesque type of approximation that we have linear dependence on temperature for density, then we could implement it as a table. So this would be a table where you look at the temperature and interpolate then the, uh, the corresponding density. Or we can use a built-in MATC language to do the exact same thing. So we have a MATC expression, we have a variable temperature, and this temperature is plugged into Tx. So this is always the name of the variable following this variable. Name is always Tx. So we just plug in the Tx to our expression, and then can use, use uh, MATC language as a sort of poor man's math lab. And uh, this has been there for the whole history of Elmer. I think it was even written by Juha before Elmer project started. So it, it certainly served as well, but also there is nowadays Lua, so which basically has almost exactly the same syntax, except you have different kind of brackets. You can also use this one and uh, uh, you can have nice mathematical expressions in both and uh, and uh, 
Lua is a little bit faster, but both can be used. Uh, eventually, you may also need to write functions because not everything is easily sort of inlined in some short function, but like for Lua or Matsi, but you may need to use a user-defined function. And for that, there is a fixed uh, programming interface. So you can call any variable that, or any keyword that is of real, uh, of real type. So you can have a function for it. So for instance, here, the same, same uh, density expression is given uh, by a function. So this is a neat way of sort of abstracting things that, okay, I may have density appearing in my simulation. Do I know to sort of have to enumerate the different ways how density can depend on different things? No, I can instead have a generic uh, way how I give any keyword to Elmer. So that's sort of maybe take a short breathe here. So that's an important part of Elmer so that real valued keywords can be usually given very freely using these different types of expressions. Okay, uh, the execution of solvers. As we remember back to the 12 solver case, uh, we solved these two solvers, uh, the heat solver and the temperature solver or flow solver sort of in a coupled way. So for them, we used so the default execution slot, which is always. So we so execute solver always. So when it comes in sort of in its order of appearance. But we have also these other slots. So we can solve solvers like before all, after all, before saving, after saving. So this could be useful, for instance, if you want to compute some data only to be uh, sold or saved uh, to disk. So you want to maybe just co compute it just before you save it. So no reason to do it otherwise. So we have these different slots. And for instance, before time step, after time step, if you have something that is not linear or not depending on, you don't have to iterate it, you know it that it just depends on time, then maybe not do it sort of iteratively, just do it once in the start of the time step. And of course, for bugging reasons, you might never, never uh, perform a solver, so you can skip the solver for debugging reasons, etc. Also, we have the flexibility that the solver can have slave solvers, so we can sort of make exceptions to the sort of uh, cyclic way that these solvers are executed, because uh, a solver can also sort of have slaves that then are called by the a master solver. So before you end up to that problem, you have probably been doing Elmer quite a long time, but that's that's some added flexibility that may come. Also, there are ways uh, in different time dependency modes in Elmer. So we have, of course, the typical transient. We have the steady state simulation. So steady state being that it doesn't depend on time. Also, there is a special uh, time dependency mode scanning, which is sort of a pseudo time. So you go through time, but the time derivatives are zero. You can do this, apply this for different scanning features. And then e equations can be harmonic or eigenmode equations. So this is sort of a, not a global sort of feature, but it's a solver specific, specific feature. So you can have like a, steady state solution, but in that steady state solution, for instance, have eigenmode simulation in one solver, for instance. So here are, for instance, uh, the definitions that you need to change the plate solver or the spit C solver to be a uh, sort of eigen solver. So, so you request that it, you perform eigen analysis and then for second order equations, you make this, this um, nice replacement where DDT is replaced by imaginary unit times omega. So here omega is of course the angular velocity. So this sort of automatically transforms all second order PDEs in time into eigen mode systems and you can then solve for the eigen modes. 
we have, of course, different shapes. So any finite element problem has to be discretized. And for that order, you need uh, uh, certain basic shapes. And uh, we have the standard basic shapes, which are, of course, 0D, just a point, 1D, just an edge, 2D, we have triangles and quadrilaterals, and 3D, te tetrahedrons, prisms, pyramids, and hexahedrons. So basically, all uh, basic shapes usually used for finite elements are available also in Elmer. Uh, and on those shapes, you can then have different types of element families. So the typical element families, of course, or the standard families, the nodal elements, but you can also have P elements, which is basically a hierarchical basis of polynomials based up or built up on the sort of lower uh, order element. So, so it's basically a something that you can recursively build up to, I guess, to 10th degree. We have edge and face elements. So uh, mathemat mathematicians talk about edge div and edge current conforming elements. And uh, you can associate those with face elements and uh, edge elements. So in face elements, the degree of freedom is the flux going through the face, whereas in edge or edge elements, the, it's the sort of amplitude in the direction of the of, of the edge. So, so these are used then to build some more exotic solvers. And there are of course different formulations that can be used on on uh, some of these elements. Not of course all combinations are possible. So if you are in the field, you probably know what your trick of the trade in your field typically are. So here are some examples of the fem bases that we use. So for instance. Uh, uh, a model that support P element could have like, like model PDE could be given the recipe that element is P3. So this would mean that you replace the linear basis with the third order polynomial uh, basis. And of course, get some, some uh, increased accuracy, but also you have some increased computational time that can actually increase quite significantly. Uh, for instance, for the lowest order edge curl conforming elements that is, are used by the Whitney AV solver, internally we use this kind of uh, element definition. So element has one nodal degree of freedom and one edge degree of freedom. And uh, for instance, there is a model mixed Poisson, which has uh, one bubble degree or so one elemental degree of freedom for uh, and uh, then also uh, one or well at, I see it's four degrees of freedom for for the quad phase and one degree of freedom for the tri triangle phase so but these are of course hidden by the end user because the end user are not is not expected to be able to define this kind of sort of very lengthy element expression. But, but inside the hood, we use sort of different type of element bases. Uh, exported variables is something that you probably have used if you have used Elmer for many years. So basically it's a way that a solver can sort of declare additional variables that sort of uh, share the same, same sort of basis so, or same uh, sort of are active on the same domain. So uh, for instance, in bodies or boundaries. So you can declare, okay, I have an exported variable and then these can be given initial conditions and uh, also they can be given sort of values in body force or boundary condition sections. So for instance, here I would imagine I would have computed like temperature and I would like to compute a rate a field called rate. So I would declare an exported variable called rate. And I would say that update these exported variables always when I'm in this solver. And then when I would have computed the temperature, I would update the rate uh, with this recipe. So which is the Arrhenius formula. So this way I would have a field variable any time that I could refer to as rate. And uh, these exported variables, they actually may live on different uh, 
places. So they can be nodal, they can be elemental, they can be discontinuous color. Can actually, they can also live on IPs, so integration points only. So this is a flexible sort of framework that you may end up using if you do Elmer a lot. Uh, then about setting boundary conditions. So uh, Dirichlet conditions is the main way or the are mainly given by the library. So the Neumann conditions, which are the flux conditions, they are typically coded in to each specific solver because they are more dependent on, on the physics of the different solver. But the Dirichlet condition, it's basically setting the value exactly as we describe it. It's basically something that the library does. So for instance, here you could give a temperature uh, a value of 273 degrees, it's just like this, or velocity, this here it's a parabolic velocity profile. And uh, for instance, if you have edge degree of freedom, then we have this special sort of um, braces or brackets for it so that we know that, okay, this is actually, it is associated so to the edge degree of freedom. So if you are using like the Whitney AV solver, then you know that the AV without the braces, it relates to the nodal degree of freedom, which is the electric potential, uh, scalar potential. And this, uh, with, when you have this small e here in brackets, it refers to the, uh, the vector potential that is living on the edge, edge degrees of freedom. And uh, actually the Dirichlet conditions, they can also be conditional Dirichlet conditions. Uh, I think this is a sort of a unfortunate naming. So conditional Dirichlet condition, it's, uh, but still uh, that's what they are called. So you could, for instance, say that, okay, apply temperature only where your velocity is positive. So basically like inlet. So this is a neat way of sort of saying that, okay, my Dirichlet condition applies only, only in parts of the boundary. Uh, a few words about nodal forces. So uh, Elmer provides automatic way to compute nodal forces. So any solver can compute nodal, nodal forces. So when you say that calculate loads, it computes nodal forces, which is basically a, a residual of the matrix equation uh, prior to applying the Dirichlet conditions. So this is basically what you just do when you compute nodal loads is loads. The nice thing with the, these nodal loads or reaction forces, whatever you want to call them, is that they have a neat physical interpretation. Like in the heat solver, the sort of residual of this equation is, is directly a nodal heat flux. So it's given in joules. And uh, for instance, for flow solve, it's it's donut nodal force, which is directly newtons. The same for stress solve, so it's directly newtons. So you actually nicely can can get not the distributed load, but the nodal load, or as the name applies. And for a stat elect solve, the nodal load would be nodal charge, which is in Coulomb, and uh, for stat current solve, it would be nodal current, which is in amperes, etc. So this is a neat thing, and uh, the neatness opens to you when you understand that the coupling between different two solvers can be done either on the sort of continuous level, so that you code up, code in the sort of whole process of coupling two different solvers, or we can do it nicely on the discrete level. So for instance, here we do fluid structure interaction, uh, uh, where we apply loads for, uh, for the displacement solver using the computed loads from the flow solver. So you can, not, uh, not only like give or compute the loads, but you can also set the loads on the right-hand side. So these are sort of uh, complementary operations. So you compute the loads or set the loads. And uh, you can, the name of the load is derived from the name of the primary variable. So for instance, for, for heat solver, it's temperature load. And uh, for uh, stress solver, for instance, it's display, displacement one, 
to etc. load. So here, for instance, what I have done here is I implement this uh, equality or this constraint on the boundary, which says that the force acting on a node on the solid is opposite to the force acting on the node of the fluid. So the, why it's opposite is because the normal direction in these two, two solvers is different because they both sort of look it from their own perspective. So what you can do then is you can say that, okay, my displacement spent one load opposes. So this opposes is sort of hides in the, that it's minus flow solution loads. So uh, we can, instead of computing a lot of sort of new uh, code, we can implement fluid structure interaction just using these two expressions. So uh, there is, of course, inside the code, there is also this FSIBC true. This is in the Navier-Stokes code. But I must say that there is quite a lot of code behind that. And this is always at least as accurate. So this is always consistent and, and uh, sort of uh, comes directly from the from the matrix equation so it's you don't have to be careful that sort of your two different pieces of code would be conflicting because you use exactly the same code for computing the loads that you did for solving the matrix equation so this is i think a nice feature of the loads also you can do like a poor man's uh like a, Dirichlet Neumann domain decomposition. So here I made a simple case. Again, here Dirichlet Neumann is basically a set of alternating boundary conditions. So for the one equation, you set uh, the temperature to be the temperature of the other. And for the other solver, you say that the uh, flux must be the, temp the flux of the other. But instead of fluxes, you can use these loads. And then when you have uh, this Dirichlet-Doiman kind of, kind of demo, domain decomposition where you iterate until convergence, you see that that actually it converges quite nicely. And, and again here, no new code needed to be done. So just taking these two revelations of the, of the heat solver, where I named just the field differently, and then I can sort of use two different heat solver instances, and they sort of then iterate a consistent solution, which is basically the domain, uh, Dirichlet Neumann domain decomposition method. Uh, you can also use periodic boundary conditions. So this is an old feature of Elmer here. There is, it's applied to some uh, large eddy simulation using variational multiscale method that you had did a long time ago. And um, here you can see again that the, uh, we apply the very boundary condition to sort of the names that are given or known for the velocity and pressure variables. So. So um, typically, this uh, periodic boundary conditions, it of course means needs two boundaries. So we have the sort of master and slave boundaries. So we need to associate them together. So you need a, two boundaries and the sort of uh, periodic boundary condition is a sort of an uh, implementation of this dual boundary condition. Uh, you can do the same with motor boundary conditions. So the difference is that periodic boundary conditions, it's a later or an earlier implementation. It's basically what you call node to surface interpolation. Uh, motor boundary conditions, they are sort of surface to surface, or if you want to say strong and weak interpolation. So basically we don't don't ask that the solution is exactly the same at given node, but we ask that uh, having the integral over the, these two surfaces, please make the solution such that the integral over our chosen test function space uh, sort of vanishes. And this is much nicer. And uh, uh, 
sort of always consistent. So, so here, for instance, is a test case where we have four different domains, each having a little bit different mesh, so that we have a sort of non-conforming boundaries and a sort of always we have sort of two set of uh, boundaries that are combined together. So we sort of like this here, this uh, mortar left master refers to the mortar left target. So, so we always have these dual sort of pairs where which are coupled together. So this is actually available as a test case, mortar Poisson 2D sum. So these slides are available and you can look most, mostly there is a consistency test case that is actually this exactly same what I used in this presentation. So this is an example. It's, it has a two sort of different zooms in of a toy model for temperature between a 2D rotor and stator. So you see that uh, sort of uh, the continuity of the solution is ensured on the, on the, on the interface using the mortar boundary conditions. And uh, these mortar boundary conditions, they are also used extensively in these rotating machines in more general. So, so here is a vector potential of electrical machine, and this is a sort of a, a toy example of one with, a, with some skew. So this is a really nice framework for sort of ensuring continuity between two non-confidence services. So uh, to summarize the difference between these different shared boundary conditions, we have three ty different types. We have the periodic, which, which is the sort of original one, node to surface. Uh, it basically applies to non-conforming, but it's not optimal in accuracy. And it a little bit spoils the matrix, but the matrix is pretty much the same. And the system of matrix size remains the same. The mortar BC basically if you don't do any numerical tricks, it increases the metric size. It is well applied to non-conforming boundary conditions. It severely spoils the matrix structure, but it's also applicable to edge uh, finite elements. So at least in, in uh, most cases. Uh, then we have a third choice, which is conforming boundary conditions. So basically we do full elimination uh, this is then, of course, not applicable to non-conforming boundary conditions. But the nice thing is that the metric size is decreased because we really eliminate the, uh, the sort of boundary conditions. The, on the other side, it does not spoil the matrix. This matrix remains very nice to solve. And actually here, if the edge, edge sort of degrees of freedom are also conforming, then you can also use that for the edges. So, yeah. Uh, there are also other types of boundary conditions, like not equality constraints, but more like inequality constraints, like we have soft limiters. Uh, here is so-called Hertz problem. So we can request that we have an upper or lower limit for any any field value it has some assumptions on the on the on the underlying partial differential equation mainly that the the sort of meaning of the computed nodal load is sort of makes sense to estimate whether whether we need to sort of lose the node from the contact set. So basically it uses two different concepts, the computation of nodal loads plus a contact set, which sort of depending on the, on the nodal load uh, sort of may then add or take away the set, uh, the node from the contact set. And uh, this is applicable to many equations. Like I think the first implementation was for for um, uh, temperate ice, sort of in the computational classology, but the same uh, method also applies to, to elasticity. So here, the Hertz problem, or like to Richard's equation uh, for dealing with, with the head of, of water pressure, etc. So uh, continuing this sort of framework, uh, 
you have the similar set, type of contact set algorithms, but you can also have them so that both of your sides are sort of uh, meshes. So this is uh, this results to contact mechanics, and uh, there is quite a bit features also in contact mechanics. But but sort of this is not uh, like uh, on a state of sort of industrial heavyweight use because. And there is some challenges in the general cases, like with the case of conflicting normals, etc., uh, for these types of e equations. And uh, this, I think, will be the last slide. So I, I know that this had, has been a very, very sort of heavy, <laughs> heavy presentation. So uh, you can also ensure consistency between meshes, not only between boundaries. So, so uh, having a sort of continuity of the solution over boundaries, it's typical like for cases where you have, uh, for instance, rotating meshes, you have periodic systems, etc. This would be like more on a case where you have a, like a, maybe some kind of multi-scale scale approach to some uh, some um, problem where you have some maybe nicely refined local solution and then uh, more like global solution and and you maybe want to start from the global one and then get some boundary conditions to the to the local one etc so here i moved this local solution here because you couldn't see it under this global one so but basically it's right here under so the nice thing with elmer is that that when we have these two boundary conditions, so for instance, in this for this global one, I I ask that that my global temperature on this uh, this boundary it would be equal to local temperature. So this equality or this expression when I need this local temperature, it uh, launches interpolation. So I don't have to do anything else. Uh, I, even if I have two meshes, Elmer knows knows where the local temperature was computed and then it launches when first needed it launches the interpolation and then sort of uh, gets the local temperature interpolated here and the same for in the other direction so actually using just these two uh, conditions and then some non some steady state iteration we can sort of do overlapping uh, uh, sort of some domain decomposition version of, of the solution so we can solve this problem so that it converges uh, and uh, have it uh, sort of be even quite fast. So, so the mapping is done automatically when variables are needed and we apply Octree search for the, for the uh, searching of the variables so it's or for, for doing the interpolation so that it's even quite speedy. Okay, I think this is the slide you are most been waiting for. So, so this was sort of a, a short overview of, of some of the capabilities of Elmer. So we have maybe around 100 solvers that try to do some specific tasks. Maybe half of them are, are used in uh, let's say more than accidentally. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in those, Elmer Models Manual is, is sort of the good reference for those. Uh, these solvers often use some generic features of the library. And these features are not documented in the Models Manual because they are applicable to most of them. So like this computation of loads or, or these boundary conditions, etc. they are not any time uh, explained in the context of the models manual because they are applicable to all of them. So if you are interested in those, then you should read the Elmer Solver manual, which was behind a lot of these slides on the later section. So, but unfortunately there are many undocumented features still. So, so this is by far not exhaustive, but maybe, maybe a hefty scratch on the service, so to say. And um, well, question, the second point, I think the second point was also partially addressed to the audience listening to, 
to this presentation. So where to go from here? So, so uh, we have at CSC, we have some uh, project projects going on currently. We have, for instance, projects on LMRIs and electromagnetics, electromechanics, and these sort of are the drivers uh, in some extent of the development. Also, we may take some nice small development ideas, but of course, large development sort of new frontiers, they are more difficult to take without any, any project. Uh, also, architecture is a driver. So uh, the architecture changes quite rapidly. So threading and GPU developments, they become more and more important. So the same code that was rather optimal maybe 10 years ago is not optimal now. So these need to be addressed if we want, want to take best use of the tomorrow's supercomputers. And uh, also, <laughs> We are operating in an open source ecosystem. So, so you can see that people choose Elmer where Elmer is good and they scratch Elmer where Elmer is not good. So, so I think that over time, this results to sort of specialization. So uh, each software focuses to where they really shine. So, so, and uh, they should take use of the other tools when suitable. So for that reason, for instance, we have been trying to uh, improve on the interfaces to other software, but, but let's say we cannot in the same way, like in the infancy of Elmer, we cannot try to sort of uh, uh, master the whole sort of field, but sort of have to build built on, on a sort of collaborative environment where different tools are used. But I would like to hear what some comments maybe and questions, uh, where to go, what, what are you missing, uh, any question on specific solvers or library features in particular, etc. So please uh, ask questions on the que question and answer section. And uh, I think we don't have so many questions, so you, you can even raise your hand so we, uh, to ask a question. So. So I think this was what I had in mind, and we only used like like sixty six minutes. Okay, so um, I have a couple of um, questions. Or I guess I'll just read them out loud for you. Okay, so um, the first question I got here says: Can I, can material data, for example, density, be defined as a table depending on more than one property? For example, density as a function of temperature and pressure. If yes, how is the interpolation done within the two D table? Linear? Uh, I don't think there is currently any any sort of ready made feature for that. No. Uh, yeah, of course, they, that would be a good sort of uh, idea to have, but but unfortunately, there is not. Okay. Uh, unless somebody has some solution of that type, then maybe he or she can raise a hand so we can hear about that. But to my knowledge, there is no such feature. Okay. And then we have a second question here asking, will there be more elaborate tutorials on contact mechanics? Uh, probably not. I mean, contact mechanics is not something with, that we are currently working with. So, so uh, I mean, there would have to be sort of some activity on that area to sort of refresh on that. But, but you can find quite a many test cases on, on uh, I think there are at least 10 test cases on contact mechanics, starting from the simple tie contact going to some frictionless contact and even some constant friction uh, consistency tests. So, so, well, I think that's the best sort of uh, material that we have. So, uh, it's, it's not really, un unfortunately, currently uh, in the active development phase. So, but yeah, if, if people are interested in that, 
certainly sort of we are open to collaboration because often we we know best what how to implement things in Elmer, but we often don't have the application and we maybe always don't sort of want to do extensive sort of application to some industrial cases etc so so there is a lot of sort of collaboration opportunities often sort of to ease and uh, burden of implementation to sort of share the task in in different ways okay um here i have another good question it says do you have a repository of non-trivial examples and um, example projects like how OpenFoam comes with a tutorial folder, for example, FSI or LES EMS projects? Well, I mean, there are even some non-trivial cases in among the tests. So there are, uh, I think if you look, look at those, not maybe all of them even are trivial. Uh, other than that, I we don't have, but of course there are like other users have created repositories for for uh, like there is this very nice Korean user who has an extensive sort of repository of very fancy Elmer cases. Uh, I think Duxa Malion Kim or something like this, who is on GitHub and uh, basically has taken uh, simple Elmer uh, consistency tests and uh, sort of upgraded them to be something really fancy. So basically doing that where we we at CSC more, more or less are not so good at. So basically taking the step from unit cube to the real industrial case. So we are often more like focused on, on just implementing and hope that others take the sort of the real sort of pain of making the complicated cases. Any other questions? Uh, yes, we have a couple. So um, here, well, this one I can answer myself. Uh, it's asking about how about Maxwell equation. I'm guessing Maxwell equation examples. We actually started a repository recently under the Elberfem um, GitHub. It's called LMAG. There you will find new, uh, um, uh, new um, examples and we will be updating them hopefully uh, continuously over the next couple of months. Yes, and that, that's also something that we, maybe if you are interested in those, you can sort of be part in, in that uh, improving on them because, because those are fully on open source uh, in the GitHub repository. And, and we hope that sort of, first we make nice tests and then these will, some of them will end up being tutorials later on. But, but now at this stage, we are collecting sort of more like raw tests. Okay. Um, there's another question here um, saying, I have never used Elmer. Just wondering if I can use Elmer instead of console. I am interested in elastic or acoustic simulations. Where should I start? Yeah, well, maybe you should start in the previous presentation. This was a little bit steep, probably. So uh, I think you should, well, first look at the models manual if that's all you need. So if we have everything, then you could use Elmer. So, so uh, I think. Elmer and Comsol, I mean, they are for different audiences. So, so for Elmer, it would not be ideal that we would like gather all the uh, sort of uh, sort of entry level users of finite elements to start using Elmer because we don't have any means to give like uh, like broad user support. Like that's the price you pay for the software, then you get the nice tutorials, the nice documentation, and you have the user support, etc. So uh, that being said, if you have sort of a more like a want to be sort of closer to your sort of code or uh, sort of closer to research, etc. I mean, there are many good reasons to use open source software and, and uh, 
then starting from can you really do those things on the open source software, then installing it, going through the base, some basic tutorials, and then understanding what the solver input file for your case really means and finding your own workflow, for instance, what is your favorite favorite uh, pre-processing tool and how do you get your meshes from that to, to Elmer then. And uh, uh, it's, it's not always just one, one recipe for all. It's like companies like Comsol, they can sort of provide you the from the start to end, but we sort of focus on more on the middle. So then you have to sort of use like part of you for the end and something else for the start and we then provide the middle. Uh, I hope that answered a little bit your question, but but yeah, there should be tutorials available if you if you want to start using. Okay, so uh, we have a good question here. It says, uh, can I use Elmer for rotating mesh uh, in the case of pumps, mixers, wind turbine simulations, etc.? I guess there the question is not so much about uh, can you do the rotation and uh, can you ensure continuity of the solution, but more the question is about the the uh, sort of underlying equations whether you can can solve uh, them robustly enough. So because these applications were clearly about turbulence, and um, if you want to solve turbulence models, then you well, you would hope that the turbulence models are so robust that they always converge. And uh, unfortunately, currently, that's not uh, the case for Elmer. So, so people have solved some some turbulence cases, even even of some complexity. But but uh, I think that sort of first checking the or getting the good sort of turbulence models working would be sort of a prerequisite for for being able to solve that kind of problem so so i think that let's say the high reynolds number of flows it's one of the one of the areas where we have to had to sort of a uh, little bit realize that okay most people are using in the open source community they are using open form or or uh, and uh, because this sort of sucks the the user or users from Elmer, there is not so much sort of pressure or projects that would help to implement the sort of robust turbulence models in Elmer. So it's more like a chicken egg problem. So, so you cannot sort of just implement new models for the fun of it. You have to have some, some uh, project or reason behind that. Any more questions? Um, yes. So uh, we have here one that says, has Elmer been used with Ghent 4 or other preferably open source Monte Carlo radiation transport codes? Anyone working on interfacing the two? Uh, Get 4. Hmm. I unfortunately don't know what Get 4 is. So, um, but if it has been used, then that's a news for me. So, so I know Elmer has been used. Uh, there is maybe in CERN, there is a software called, called maybe Garfield++ or something like this. I don't know if it's Monte Carlo, but I know that it uses Elmer as one alternative backend to compute the, uh, the electric fields. So I could imagine there could be something related to charge particle transport there. Uh, yeah, we we have done some like, uh, for instance, in the in the YouTube channel, you find some cases where we did some some uh, particle charge particle transport using Elmer, so that even the particles they they their effect on the on the Poisson equation they are accounted for. So you have sort of a, we have solved like a self-consistent uh, Poisson problem where the right-hand side uh, comes from the moving particles. Uh, 
but I don't know if I would recommend Elmer to that kind of application because you know the particle machinery is not that robust. Following particles in finite elements is not straightforward. Uh, yeah, but to, so the answer is I don't know that it would have been used. Okay. Um, the next question I think uh, it's a simple one. Uh, it's um, would you please publish the LaTeX source code of Elmer documentation on GitHub? And I think I can answer that. Uh, it's already there. So if you actually go, I, I don't know if it's, it's is it public? Uh, the it's well, it's in GitHub, but it's in a private repo. So so the uh, the manuals are are in the. Uh, or sorry, the tutorials are in the public repository. Uh, well, unfortunately, so far we have sort of uh, well kept it to ourselves because, um, or in a closed repository, partly because, uh, well, we have written most of the code. At, uh, for instance, the library part almost exclusively comes from CSC, and then it it sort of is, uh, well, we sort of maybe don't want to give that sort of, uh, or don't see maybe added value so much in giving that out, because as long as the most contributions come from CSC, like giving the solver manual out, I could imagine that, for instance, the models manual could be the next step, because uh, because the modular structure means that some models are are actually developed by by the community. For instance, in El Elmerai's community, they develop their own modules and actually have their own documentation also for that. And uh, of course, then it would be possible for instance maybe to for community to contribute in in making. Uh, or changing the format of the documentation so that they could be, for instance, in some other format also. I'm a little bit reluctant to give up LATE because you, you see some of the equations, they are so so uh, lengthy that you cannot really do without LATE. But uh, still, some documentation might be like in some other format too. But yeah. Okay, and uh, now a tough question. Uh, it's about features within Elmer. It reads, uh, how to 3D model lamination actual flux motor, where lamination goes in radial uh, direction? Do I have to model every steel sheet in GMSH or any other software? Or do, uh, some solver, or do you have some solvers where I could define stacking factors still uh, over insulation in between the sheets? It's in the radial direction. So basically, I think uh, the person is asking if you can, you have to model each uh, magnetic uh, sheet, or is there a feature where you have a homogenized stack? Um, I would maybe not know how to answer directly. So, do we have somebody in the audience who would know the answer? Uh, unfortunately, it seems that if there is somebody in the audience, maybe you can raise your hand so so you can be. Given access. Yeah, I, I couldn't. OK, there is one person who raised hand. So can you, Jonathan, give the right to answer? Uh, yeah, uh, voila. Um, there's a nice description in uh, 2D, uh, two and a half D, uh, free software called FEM, F E M M. -M. And uh, in, the, in the description uh, at the end, you find how this elimination is uh, described. Okay, 
uh, maybe you can send send uh, some uh, well some email to us and uh, well I can do this yeah so we can look at this but uh, but perhaps we cannot at least implement it now during this session so so but I I'm not totally sure that whether we have or not so so. Uh, my my sort of involvement in the in the small details of the electric machine sort of modeling has been sort of not total so okay that was our last question okay great so we managed to squeeze this all in 84 minutes so so i apologize for the for the sort of rather heavy content, but I hope it was useful also for the sort of power user side. So, so, um, and uh, I would think that I could have talked like two or three times the same time of, of some features that were not mentioned. So, so I was, I gave you some mercy anyway. So, so, but um, I think we have come to the end and, uh, and, uh, just some final words on the. Uh, this presentation is already available here at uh, at this uh, site on Nick Funet Fi. Of course, you don't see the animations, but but even without the animations, there might be something interesting in that. So that's already available there, as is the 12, 12 solvers test case. Yeah, thanks for from my side. Do we have something to say more? Uh, we can say a couple of words about uh, the continuation of the series. Uh, as we know, this is continuing now on a weekly basis, and uh, and next part is coming next Thursday on the twenty fifth at fifteen hundred hours uh, uh, Eastern European time. And the topic is. Uh, Parallel computing with Elmer. Yes. So see you then after one week. Uh, I think it will be a little bit more practical than this time. So Thomas will show some nice demonstration and uh, and uh, uh, there will be a little bit less formulas and uh, maybe even less animations, but but more practical side. So. So I hope you can all enjoy, uh, join the meeting and let's see you in one, one week.